Welcome to the Tom Nelson podcast. I'm here with Kenneth P. Green. And uh, Kenneth, could you tell us a little bit about yourself to kick things off here? Sure. So basically, I'm a policy analyst, and I've been at this since about 1992. My background is in biology and environmental science. I studied biology and environmental science at UCLA primarily, and I have a doctorate in environmental science and engineering. And uh, I went into the policy world back in 1994, so right after my doctoral degree, starting for the Reason Foundation and working on public policy analysis. But, and the reason is that I joined them was because even when I was doing my doctoral studies and we would be looking at case studies and examples of environmental problems in the real world and how they were being solved, even before I finished my doctoral studies, even the classwork portion of my doctoral studies, I came to realize that the entire field of EHS, which I had thought was about the very pragmatic job of fixing environmental problems, right? So things like wastewater treatment plants, which I was studying how to design wastewater treatment plants, how to prevent actual releases to the environment, how chemicals move through the environment that can be remediated chemically, pulled back out of the soils, neutralized, things like that. Very pragmatic engineering-based fixing the environment where humans have broken it was not what they were actually pursuing in their policy angles and the policy, policy elements of the, of the instruction. And that became more and more obvious as we came into that my program had a policy, public policy component to it, where we studied environmental law at the law school and planning at the, at the school of planning, architecture, school of architecture, all of those things, interdisciplinary aspects to, to understand the intersections of EHS and rules and regulations so that one could function there. That was the goal of the program. And I quickly came to realize that, that my libertarian self, which had formed when I was 19, was not happy with that direction of, of the field. And so pretty much as soon as I was done studying it, I found myself in the role of a regulatory or a policy critic rather than a policy or regulatory designer. I didn't even think to go to work for an agency. I knew that was going to be a non-starter because most of the time I'd be wanting to say no or, you know, we're not going to regulate on this because it's not our business or there's no problem here or whatever. And, and I've been doing that ever since. And I've written, I started out early. My doctoral degree was on, I was looking at the ride sharing, basically air pollution regulations in Los Angeles. And so I started with that and moved onward to climate change within a couple of years because air pollution policy was already being eaten by climate change. One of the tragedies of the entire climate change agenda is that it has eaten so many other environmental and health and safety issues that themselves are highly important to people and really highly important to the if people who believe in environmental protection and the environment itself. And climate change like this, like this world girdling amoeba has sucked in these issues which were being treated rationally on their own, conservation of certain species, conservation of rivers, certain rivers, protection of certain ecosystems, and it sucked them all into this one world girdling thing in which now they're actually traded away against each other. It's like, let's protect the desert. Yeah, yeah. Unless we need solar panels, in which case, let's level the desert. We need, let's protect the forests. Absolutely. Unless we actually need to use them for biofuels. Then we can cut them down and we'll just grow, you know, canola or, or we'll grow oil, palm oil. And so, so, and I worked on issues like all basically all the way through air pollution, electric vehicles. I moved into energy for a while after I got simply overdosed on climate change policy, okay. thinking, well, energy will still be more pragmatic. I mean, really still, it's about counting, you know, joules and about power and, and everything and keeping the lights on. And that there, there has to be a pragmatic grounding in the energy field that you can, instead of the emotional, you're a, you're a, you're a liar, you're a liar, climate battle. But then, of course, climate change came, the amoeba, the giant giant space amoeba of climate change came and sucked all of energy policy right into its umbrella as well. And so my my whole career now, 20 some odd years, has been basically working, fighting against the giant climate amoeba. The, the climate amoeba also is one of the, one of the problems with it is, as I wrote elsewhere, it, it's, uh, it's essentially a socialist, a socialist amoeba. And that became clear from the very, very first agreement, the Kyoto Agreement, which, and I've written about this in the past, which is, a, it, it was, again, it was a, a tragic mistake to give this to the, give the issue to the United Nations in the first place, because a, a more bungling organization has never been invented in the history of the earth. 
they they are like a wonder of the wonder of the earth because they're they're like the, the black hole of incompetence or malicious actually malevolence really. Really, but anyway, in '97 when they when they took the Kyoto Protocol, there was a there was a turning point to be made. There it was still early. There was still time to decide how one was going to move ahead with addressing the issue of climate, whether it was going to be mitigation or whether it was going to be an adaptation, and how. And what they chose was 90% mitigation, and they chose explicit how was by redistribution of wealth. Right? So they, they, they chose an overt socialist management plan, literally five-year plan, because and, and, they, would, they would, again, put out their reports every five years, right? right. So, so they, they went with the, essentially the old Ch Chinese and Soviet, we will have a five-year management plan, it will be directed by government, by us, and you will do as you're told, and we'll have these technocratic targets for you to achieve. And, and, and that was just a, tra a huge and tragic mistake. And, and as soon as they, they, they put into play these giant funding flows, they came, those right the promises of funding, nothing else mattered. At that point, you'd, every single time a, a meeting would happen, would come, the answer would be, I want my money. I want more money. It's, it's a lot like in, in there's a great car commercial in Canada. I was living in Canada for quite a while. There's a great spoof about Quebec, which is basically all they ever do is demand money, which is, I want money. What, what is, what's it going to take to get you to go along with this? Money. Send money. Where's my money? And that, that's really, that's what it became with climate change. It's like, well, where's my money? And it is still now where they pledged, what, a billion, trillion dollars a year, something like that. And there was never any way they were going to put money like that into account and give it away. Nobody, nobody gives away money. And so, you know, so that's where we are now. And, and right now, these days, I'm still doing the same thing. I'm analyst, except I've also added a stream of analysis on plastics, which are related. Of course, the climate monster is trying to eat plastics as well. But uh, I happen to love plastics. I think they're one of the greatest inventions we've been ever made. And of course, they're under attack by by a bunch of idiots who who don't don't have any grasp of the magnitude of the the, the what a an unbelievably huge thing it is to have invented a new material that did not exist on the entire planet and may not exist anywhere that we know of which is as useful as the one, more useful than all of the materials we were given by, by on earth combined. I think, and you want to ban them. Why? Because you're idiots. But. So uh, didn't George Carlin have some sort of comedy uh, skit about how the whole reason that God invented humans is so that he could have plastic? And there was something about that. I wouldn't be surprised. He has a great, George Carlin has several great routines. One on, on taking risks, which I won't say here because he, as he is, of course, quite profane, but he had a great one on people's, people's reluctance to take risks and their, their risk aversion. And he was not, uh, not a fan of risk aversion. Okay. So I don't think he would have been big on masking, but you never know. They, I think he wouldn't. COVID no. showed people, enough, a lot of people who I thought were more sensible than that lost their minds. Absolutely. Yeah. So how do you think we can battle this amoeba? Do you think it's going to be around forever, the, the huge amoeba of climate, the climate scam amoeba? Well, you know, forever is a long time. And, and I actually didn't think I would be around this long doing it. I thought, you know, when I first thought, first did it, I, I uh, my boss said, you know, you should write about climate change. And I, at that point, I was only three years out of my doctorate and I had been taking in environmental atmospheric chemistry and atmospheric distribution and circulation and things. And I was kind of like, now, really? Okay, uh, so I did a couple things thinking it'd be a one-off because I didn't think this, the climate thing would last as long. And of course, it's the subject that ate my life. But the the thing is, history has this odd way of moving other balls down the court at the same time. So yeah, the amoeba is still doing its thing. On the other hand, they're victims of their own success. The amoeba is somewhat of a, a victim of its own success and that it has made so many changes that as we predicted, you and, and myself and others, have been predicting since 1990s when they when they said we we're going to do this electric vehicles battery vehicles high speed rail whatever these things were and we'd be saying it's not going to work and here's why here are the grounds why it won't work they went ahead and did them anyway but now they're failing for the reasons that we actually had set and they're they're failing in large groups all at once and so you're looking at the whole energy system collapses that are going on around Europe, and the Europeans are walking away, basically saying, well, the hell with this, we're not going to freeze to death in the dark. So if we have nuclear, we're going to keep our nuclear going. But if we don't, we're going to keep our gas going, and then we're going to keep our coal going. And if we have to, we'll go to wood. And you know, if it gets really bad, we'll invade your country and burn your wood. 
with you in it. So we're, we're getting back to those days of, of the failure. And I think we might see some, some sharp backward movement of the amoeba after, for a while, at least. I think, I think there, there will be a, a pause, especially there could be a, well, there could be a very big pause if things end very badly in Ukraine, right? It wouldn't take much for there to be a world energy crisis that has people literally like, you know, yeah. looking, looking for spare furniture in the garage they can burn to keep warm. It seems like that might be coming. Richard Linson was just on here and he was saying, I can't believe this has been going on for 30 years already in his experience. We got to be closer to the end than to the beginning, to the beginning, I think. But we'll yeah, I, I would, I would think the problem can't, there's a saying, right? Things that can't continue forever won't. Um, and I think the big lies of climate change, I think are coming to an end. I read somewhere, supposedly a leak of the next IPCC report has them confessing that their models were 80% basically too hot. That they were that the actual trend is one fifth of what the models were predicting over the time since since the IPCC has been in existence. Now I can't figure out whether they're putting that out, and that this might be the last IPCC report. I don't know whether they're they're doing that as a way of saying we have to get out of this before everything crashes. Right? <laughs> Okay. We, we want to be we we want to be out before the lights go off before and before the peasants have the pitchforks. So I don't know whether the the, the advanced rats are fleeing the ship early, but yeah, the winter the winter this winter could tell a very big tale. I mean, it, it might or might not, but things are looking really really, from what I understand, very very bad in Europe. It sure sounds like it. I, I do think we're going to get to the point where the scientists are going to say, oh, look at all the weasel words we used and the media blew this all out of proportion and we never really believed it was a crisis. And then the media is going to blame the scientists that they're going to say, oh, we're just we're reporting what you told us that wasn't our fault. I think we're going to see that type of thing. I hope I'd like to see that uh, sooner rather than later. I think we'll see some of that. I, I don't think that I, I could wish that they would actually do that and say, Okay, we, we, we were careful. If you look in the IPCC reports, and I've said this also, as you know, since the beginning, I read the, I read the things, and especially the Working Group 1 report, they are very careful they, with, their, with their wording. Sometimes they're cutesy about it, but, but they, are, they are pretty careful about it. And, and it does not translate into summaries well, and it doesn't translate into the political speech at all, and it doesn't translate into the media in fact, it, it disappears completely. It becomes certainties from from Olympus, right? So, but I think what's going to happen is they just won't talk about it. That's what that's the, the trend of modern times is when things go completely wrong. Like, well, for example, what happened? COVID. Are we ever going to talk about the the complete disasters of education and what, what happened to seniors in their in their uh, in their uh, senior homes? And are we ever going to talk about any of that? No. They're already moving on. It's like, oh, that's, you know, the media is going to be, well, that was, yeah, that was, that's yesterday. I think that's a great point. Very good. Today's Very crisis good. is something else. Climate change, well, you know, that was yesterday. And, so, and, and besides, it, we, we had, it would have worked but for the evil oil companies. And that'll be the entirety uh, of the narrative. I, I do hear a lot of people saying that we're going to get to 2030 or 2050 and the weather's still going to be the same as it always was, uh, just as bad and, and as good as it always was. And they're going to say, look, we say it would have been way worse had we not done all this heroic stuff. And uh, you can thank us uh, right now for all the great work we did. Otherwise, the hurricanes would have been much worse than the same old hurricanes we're always getting. I think there's going to be some of that, too. Yeah, they'll be putting it up on Twitter, which is I just got my 85th climate change injection and I, 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 got, I, I caught, another, caught another bad weather day. But because of all the climate change policy I paid for in the last 40 years, I feel yeah. so much better. Yeah, that is a good one. You are one of the people, one of the few people who actually reads the IPCC reports in depth, right? I don't think many people go beyond reading even what the media just says about the IPCC reports. I think that's about it. But you really get in there and read hundreds of pages, I guess, huh? Yeah, I do. I did, especially. When I, so when I first started out, like I said, I was writing about air, air quality and I had, had studied the basics of, of climate in my doctoral degree. And my boss gave me the time and she said, you know, I'd like you to write something about the, all the... This, Kyoto is approaching. It was 94. The, the negotiations are going on about these things. It looks like it's going to be a big deal. I'd like you to look into it, study it, see if, what its policy ramifications are going to be. This is a libertarian think tank. And I'd write about it. And I, so I said, okay. And, and I started looking at it. And I, I said, I quickly, quickly realized to my boss, I said, you, you realize this is not going to be a fast thing. And I was a young, wet behind the ears kid. And she was a senior person in the policy world. I said, this is not going to be like a, a, an immediate turnaround thing. I'm not going to write about something this important without actually reading the literature. And that was the, at that time, it was the second assessment report. 
which is about yay thick. The science volume is this thick, and the other two are equally thick. I said, so, so I'm going to read this, and then I'm going to also read about the last two years of climate publications in the major journals, Nature, Science, and Climate, and a few others. And then I'll be ready to, to write about this. It's going to take me about three or four months to get through all, all that. And to her credit, she said, fine, go ahead and do it. She said, she said, you know, yeah, if you're gonna if you're gonna write about something, you, you ought to actually study it first. So I did. And I read, I actually read them cover to cover with me and my highlighter and large, large amounts of coffee. I very quickly came to the conclusion that working group one, which is the the scientific basis of climate change, I felt it, I, I felt it was a very, very good representation of the state of knowledge on that subject. It didn't contradict anything I had learned before in any of my other science classes. And I, like I said, my degrees are in molecular biology and environmental science and engineering. So pretty cross-disciplinary. It looked very good. I could read all of it because the, it, it, I had enough cross-training to be able to handle all the chemistry and everything else. And I thought they were pretty, they were, they were quite cautious in the way they expressed what they were, what they were talking about. It was, it was just, it was simply good. It was a, it was a very good summation of the state of knowledge in there. And so I read it. And I also did the same for the third assessment report. And I was an expert reviewer on the third assessment report for the IPCC, as well as being an expert reviewer on another one after that on aviation and the global climate. I was asked to be an expert reviewer on that one because I had been on the previous one and I knew the author. I, I, I had corresponded with the author about some questions I'd had about aviation and how it worked. So, so yeah, I've read them. And, and then I, so I read, I think the fourth assessment report one was the last one I read. Literally, I, I, that I, I, I went through my, my festival of masochism and actually read it cover to cover. The nice thing about them is they tend to be structured the same way. So at this point, now I know which sections I really need to go to to bring myself up to date on AR5, AR6, which is out, AR7, which is coming. But so yeah, I, I, I made myself do that. And not too many people that have, have done that. I actually had one, one person who was a lead reviewer of one of the segments of the IPCC report. We were in a debate together on, I was on television actually, and he, he kind of shocked me because I said, I said, we were on stage and it was, it was being broadcast. And I said, uh, so I read, I read this, I read the whole thing cover to cover and, and, and uh, made my comments and it, they got to him and he said, and he looked at me, he said, you read the whole, that whole, the whole thing cover to cover. I said, yeah. And he actually looked at the moderator and he said, you know, I read my section. I'm going to defer to him on everything else because I haven't read it. And I don't know anybody else who has. So yeah, I, but I, it's worth, I mean, it really, it's painful if, but if you have the, if you, if you have the chops to, to handle the, the, the nomenclature, right. The, the, it's the jargon that, that'll kill you. The jargon and the nomenclature are just ultra dense, but it's worth doing. But in your experience, the IPCC scientists, the people that contributed in some way, wouldn't you say that an enormous percentage of them probably don't read the whole thing? They read? Oh yeah, no, I, I don't think, yeah. I, I think the very, very few read the whole, read the whole thing or even read one whole volume coherently. That's, that's the stuff that, that's the, the staff at the UN that actually then works to to politicize it. Yeah. I, I mean, that is where that happens. It seems like what's sold to the public, it's maybe 3,000 scientists and all of them and bless every single line in the underlying report. Yeah. But nothing like that. No, no, it's, yeah. it'd, be, it'd, be, it'd, be, it'd be crazy. I mean, I, I wouldn't, I, like I said, I did it because for my own peace of mind, I thought if I'm going to write about this and I'm going to make a, it's going to be a part of my career, I, I really should I have the duty to, of knowledge and the duty to study. Okay. But I mean, for most people, it would be. I and mean, even most people in the field, like when I was working on, in molecular biology and I was studying, well, I was studying abstract binding proteins in chicken embryos, I, my reading in the rest of cellular and molecular biology wasn't all of it. All I focused on was my, my, my niche, right? And so if you're, your atmospheric chemist is going to focus on their one niche, they're like going to focus on their one chemical and probably focus on one stage of that chemical's adaptation as it moves through the environment, that's going to be all they focus on in their career and the research of their, their competitors who are looking at the same thing. That's probably going to be the boundaries of their normal reading. They might go a little further than that. But really, in order to succeed in the science, if you're doing the science, you have to be monomaniacally focused on this one thing. As of uh, AR2, you said the underlying science and working group one looked pretty good to you. You read through it and it seemed to make sense. Did that hold yep. even through AR6 or did it get way better or worse? Or It 
It still hold, I think it still mostly holds. It, I, I'm working on a paper now, and I, I'm in, I've been, been going through AR6 technical summary. And so, so we have to understand, we have to talk about something. So you have the underlying technical reports, the, a, the assessment reports, working group volume one, volume two, and volume three. Volume one is the science. Volume two is more or less modeling. Volume three is, pol is social policy is social science. But then each of them has a technical summary prepared inside. And each of them has a summary for policymakers in each of the volumes. And then the three volume set collected is boiled down into one synthesis report. And it has a summary for policymakers, right? So the, the level of fidelity becomes more and more dilute the farther you get from the Bible, the tome, right? So when you, when you move to the technical summaries, you start seeing that that's where a decision has to be made reasonably, what to include in a summary and what not. So we have this 800 pages of dense data, more in the summary, you start to see more of a folk emphasis on how will the climate change in the future? What are the risks? And then in the, in the summary for policymakers, all you see is how will it, we've seen, this is what we've seen, but it's going to be horrible, right? So if you stick to the technical materials, as far as I can tell, they're still playing it pretty, pretty, pretty square. There have been some questionable calls over time. There, there, there's a, a certain veneer of confidence that was applied after, I think it was on the fourth assessment report, it might have been the third, in which they started to use numerical rankings where they would basically poll the authors and say, how confident are you that this is correct? And if they said, I'm 95% confident or 80% confident or whatever, then they would, they would take those numbers and they would put a, a specific label to them saying high confidence, medium confidence, low confidence, overwhelming confidence, whatever. And they, they portrayed it, but, but they, they portray it as if it was some sort of a statistically derived value. And, and I remember I wrote about this back way back when there was a, the, when they first introduced this, they put it in a footnote, it was very cutesy of them. They put it in a footnote saying that it was, they had instituted this new methodology of, of stating confidence levels using informal Bayesian analysis, informal Bayesian meta-analysis, I think it said something like that. And, uh, and <laughs> I'm, I'm not a statistician, so I looked at it, I looked at it and I thought, what is this? And and I inquired of my statistician pals. I said, so what, what, are you, what are they doing here? He said, they're just polling the authors and asking them how confident they are in their own work. That's it. <laughs> and, and so, but then, but then they put a number on it. It's like, oh, I'm 95% confident, confident that I got that right. Okay. And then, so that's, that's what goes forward into the high confidence. But it's really, so, so they play a little bit, bit fast and loose with, whether these are statistical tests of confidence, as in a chi-squared test or a, you know a p-test te p or whatever, they're not. They're 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 expert solicit what they call expert elicitation essentially, which is asking the people who wrote the work that they believe in the work. So I have two follow-up questions. One is, uh, are climate skeptic scientists at all involved in like AR six? Any Rich Richard Lindzen type people at all? Are, were they involved? Uh, I know they were earlier on. That's one question. And the next question for later is, uh, who is in the room when they're actually writing that top level summary for policymakers? Is that a bunch of people who actually have read all the underlying science or, or not? Yeah, I don't know if there are any skeptical scientists left involved in the IPCC process, partly because, I mean, I, the thing is once, if you become political outside the IPCC, you're not invited back again. So I, I was not invited back again to be an expert reviewer after I wrote things based on my being an expert reviewer that said, well, but this is actually what it says in the report, as opposed to this, what, what this politician is claiming, you know, I didn't get invited back again. I, I'd be surprised if Roger Pialki Jr. isn't still appearing in there for some of the papers that he writes. I'd be surprised if Christy, is it Roy Spencer or John Christy, isn't still, aren't still getting pieces in there. I don't know whether Judith Curry is completely retired or not, or Nick Lewis who they write on climate sensitivity, they probably have their work included at least in the analysis and then in the discussion. They usually, that usually, that's that's one of the ways, one of the reasons I've, I, in the past, I've maintained confidence in the science volume because they have in the past taken that in, information from like Lewis and Curry and incorporated it into their discussion of climate sensitivity. And previously that was done with Pielke's work on hurricanes, I think as well. There, there has been, actually, are there actually ones active now? 
I don't know, like you said, 30 years, it's, we're 60 years old. It's a dying breed. And Lindsay was there 20 years ahead of us. So, and, and right, and, and Pat, Michael's passed away recently. So he's gone. I'm not too sure how many are left that are actually are in the university that haven't been essentially either chased out of the university, retired or dead because of their political views. So that they're not, they don't even have a, they don't have an institution from which to enter the IPCC process. Uh, who decides who gets to be a lead author and who decides who sits in that room when they make this summary for policymakers? That's the UN secretariat, basically. That, that's, that's all the politics. The, the government's agency, the, like the US, right, appoints people to serve on the, for the UN process. So they solicit reviewers and things. So I got solicited by, wasn't EPA running it? I think it was NCAR. I don't remember who exactly it was. But you'll get an invitation to, to be a reviewer. You, or you can actually, there's a, a solicitation that goes out and says, do you want to be a reviewer? You can then say yes. Or your government could say, we nominate him. Governments can nominate you. So I got nominated to be a reviewer. But it's all just, then it moves up to the chain to the, to the IPCC, which is a UN organization. And the bureaucrats then, of course, decide who the lead authors are. And that, that's, it, that is an interesting point, which is, People don't understand that the, the overall purpose of the IPCC is not, does not stop with we're trying to understand the climate. The overall purpose of the IPCC is, in their, in their mind, to answer questions for world governments about what to do, right? right. And so, so they, they structure the IPCC reports as advice to governments as to what to do. And that's purely political, and that that whole selection of of authors and the, the what's to be put in the summaries is a political thing that happens at the IPCC secretariat, uninvolved with the people who wrote the other underlying volumes. There there is a big theater at the theater stage at the end where once the technocrats at the UN have crafted what they think the, the summary for policymakers should look like, it goes out and it gets reviewed by all the underlying authors who, in theory, come back and say, yeah, I'm okay with this. And that's the junior authors that, 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 that get that, that treatment. Then at the end of the day, there's, there are supposedly, I guess, in-person meetings where they finally go with the senior, with the lead authors of the chapters. That, they're all pyramids. You have the lead authors, secondary authors, contributing authors, flunky author one, flunky two, flunky three, flunky four, right? All the way down. The contributing, the, the, the coordinating authors, lead authors, they get gathered into a room with the bureaucrats or the technocrats, and they go, supposedly go line by line through the summary for policymakers, where like the Russian judge in the Olympics, they can hold up a sign that says, you know, no, yes, no, whatever, but, and they, they vote, you know, do I, do you believe that those people at that level are going to have the, the spine to, to really stand up to depoliticize what's said after years of work on the project with years more ahead and the prestige that comes with doing it? And wanting to do it again, that's one of the that's one of the pitfalls of of you know the 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 tit for tat concept of so, sociality, which is you do a good job this time, we'll have you back next time, and it's a huge sign of respect in the sciences to be heading these off these chapters. Are they going to actually really defend their turf and say you're overstating this significantly there is actually right and and this is actually incorrect this is going to lead the wrong you know i don't i i very much doubt they're going to buck the bureaucrats at the un so it just wouldn't you know human nature just would suggest they're not going to do that yeah so for me as an outsider it, comp it seems completely farcical that we should expect scientific truth with a capital t to come out of this process when they would never webcast this for example right so we can see what actually people are saying as they're negotiating each line no, by line. No, no, no. That's, yeah. that's totally private. No. Yeah. So who knows what they're saying? But uh, yeah. yeah, you know, there's no way. I think, like I said, I think the science start, the science part stops more or less in volume one. Now, even in volume one, climate change is like an onion, right? At the very center of it, and I, this may be controversial, at the very center of it, there's simply physics, which is if you have a certain kind of gas molecule and you have radiation of a certain kind, either coming down from the sun or coming up from the ground and it hits this molecule of gas, if it's the right wavelength to inter interact with the, with the shapes of the atoms, right, the electrons and protons, whatever, the, that, that molecule vibrates, that heat 
and that latent heat gets given out to the environment and spreads from there. To me, that's not controversial. That's just physics. I mean, you can demonstrate that. I can demonstrate here that in my kitchen with a glass jar, a candle, and a spectroscope from your camera, from a camera setup, right? So, but then you, you go further from that, which is, okay, what does that little vibration do in the atmosphere when there are other factors involved? How much does it spread? How much does it build up? How long those gases last? What's the long, what, what are the effects as you spread out from the, those initial events and the confidence level, basically you move from physical law of, right? The photon strikes a, an atom, boom. You, you move away from that to statistics. Well, a certain percentage of these things are gonna hit a certain percentage of those things and, and it spreads out and out and out. And the further you get from those fundamental impacts, the less certainty you have. So when you get away from direct things you can measure and read and see in real time, the confidence, in my opinion, drops right off of a cliff. And so, yeah. so but, I, but I, I feel sorry for some people who say, you know, like I, when I say that, I've been, I've been actually attacked by skeptics, which is that I'm, I'm giving too much by saying climate change is real or global warming is real. Greenhouse effect is real. What am I going to, am I going to say gravity's not real? Newton got physics wrong? What? So, Were you officially a contributing author? Was that your title or? No, I was an or expert reviewer. Expert reviewer. Okay. But yeah. when the summary for policymakers is coming out, nobody ever goes back to you and says, do you agree with everything it says here? There's no, 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 no step no. like that, right? No. Yeah. Okay. Now the expert reviewers are only on the technical documents. And did you submit comments and they were handled pretty well, did you think? Or? Well, I didn't follow. I didn't, didn't, they were handled. They, I mean, they were accepted. They were acted upon. They were, they were internalized. I don't know the, the process. You don't, you don't get feedback saying each, each person doesn't get, not get feedback saying we, we did this change or we didn't do this change or we did that change or not. Cause there's thousands, there are thousands of reviewers. Okay. At some point they released the comments and the responses to the comments in PDF form about maybe five years ago, I was reading tons of that. I don't know. I think they did it. Yeah. They, yeah, I think that's right. I think they did, but I'm not. But those I think may have only been for the major, the major authors. I don't remember. I don't remember how far down the the, the the pyramid they went. So, are you working on climate change at all right now? Anything? That, yeah, I'm. Okay. Yeah, I'm, I'm still working in the in the amoeba. Yeah, I was living in Canada for about ten years before I moved back to the states two years ago. I'm still working on climate change. Canada's climate agenda is extremely aggressive. There, they have a, a, a quite aggressive liberal left, leftist government that is absolutely dedicated to the whole net zero concept, net zero 2050 Davos G8 thing. And so I've been writing about climate change there for quite a while. And right now what I'm writing is something near and dear to my heart. One of the things that I've written about over the years, and I've, I've got, by the way, if you're any of your listeners are happen to have a publisher handy, I wrote a book when I, during the COVID period. I wrote, took the time to write a book on risk modeling, essentially, and, and how the, the in, incorporation of risk modeling into regulation was a huge mistake because risk modeling is very speculative, but it's treated like evidence when it gets merged into government agencies, and it's, but it's not evidence. And so what you have is a government agency that can use force upon you and coerce you ostensibly based on evidence in a legal manner, but they're treating this, these modeling exercises as if they're evidence, but they're not. They're just basically statistical systems of probability, like a, a system for beating the craps table, right? right. So, so I wrote a book about that called A Plague of Models, uh, in which I point out that these models started coming in with air pollution modeling uh, and then into climate modeling, and they stopped simply looking at what the data says and they started looking more at what their models told them until they went to the point where they were completely, completely obsessed with models only and models became the reality. And that's been the case in climate change for 20 years. Models are, models are the reality for the people in the climate change world, but they're not for the rest of us. So what I'm working on now is a, a piece, a little piece for Fraser called Climate Change Models Versus Measured where I'm basically going to try and going to show it's like gonna, I've been working through the, the, the summary of technical summary of working group one of AR6, basically pulling out the sections that's like, so here's what it actually says the temperature has done during the recorded period, the instrumental period, and even going back to 150 years ago, because at least we had 
thermometers, right? And then, but here, and so that's the real part. Sea level rise, here's what it says from 150 years ago to today. This is the real part. Greenhouse gas emissions, this is the real, these are the, this is the data. And then, no, and, and notice that that in most cases, these, these are monotonic lines. They're not really changing. But here's the modeling, which is the, the modeling backward is, oh, well, we have these ice cores. And then we have these tree rings and things, right? So the modeling comes in with the, this change here is that it's the X in Y. It's the worst in 50 years. It's the least in 50 years. It's the greatest thing since sliced bread. That's all modeling. And so the, I'm making the distinctions between how what we actually know, which is remarkably little, really. We actually have the satellite data. We have the ground temperature record. We have some limited ocean temperature records of marginal representation over the Earth's surface. It's a small amount of data. And by itself, it's not worrying. And if you were to use only Newton's first law, which is that objects in motion tend to remain in motion, right? And you simply do a straight extrapolation, you'd look at these trends and you'd go, you're not afraid. As somebody once said, if the sea level, tre sea level trend trends continue, I could actually pick my house up and crawl away from the seashore, right? In time to, to avoid problems, it's so slow. So, so I'm working on that. That's, it's going to be about, that's like a 15,000 word study. It's just a, it's just the kind of thing that Fraser Institute is big on empirical measurement and likes to, to put things out. It's try, basically trying to, to remind people that like, that, that, you know, look at, let's look at the data and, and keep orienting our discussions based on real world, what's happening in the real world, not imaginary models or philosophical frameworks or political arguments or so I think the late Freeman Dyson pointed that out, that he looked at climate science, alarmist climate science, and he thought that they were confusing a modeled reality or models with reality. That was a big problem. They worked so hard on the models that they didn't take the time to compare it as the outsiders are doing. That's what I'm doing is looking at reality and, uh, and not trusting the models. I think that's one big problem. You'd agree with that? Oh, absolutely. And Pat Michaels also used to say the same thing. And in fact, one of my professors used to say the same thing. I was just in contact with him. He was a chemist and we were just chatting. We were talking about the state of, of things. And he said, you know, one, one experiment, actual measurement based experiment is worth a thousand models or 10,000 models. And, and at the same, in the same way, a model is worth one, one, one ten thousandth of an actual experiment. Maybe personally, I go even further. I don't believe modeling is science. Science, science is empirical. It stops at the, it stops at the point where, where it stops being empirical. So if you can't measure it and you can't test it and you can't repeat it and right, you can't use the, you can't apply the scientific method to it and it's not science. Modeling, you can't do that because you can't test the future. You can't test against the, the future or the, right? Or really you don't have data in the past either. It's, it can't be calibrated or ver validated. So it's not science, but they get to call themselves scientists. They get to work in a lab with a computer instead of actually having to get out and do unpleasant stuff in the field. Um, but that's where we are. Yeah, the, a lot of them have confused their models with reality. Excellent. You mentioned Canada. It just blows my mind. The leadership in Canada, do they actually believe that Canada is too warm and global cooling <coughs> would, be, would be good for Canadians? They really think uh, that. One should not ascribe fixed beliefs to politicians because they don't have them. They, 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 the fixed belief that a politician has is in his own greatness or her own greatness and his or her own rightness and, and, and in the, his or her own plan for what they want. But otherwise, politicians are what they, what they think is not really about reality. It's simply about what they can get. So now I think there, the, the, that being said, the, the leadership of the current government of Canada is, as they would like to say about the far right, they are far left. They are possibly, I think, the, the most left, leftist socialist government Canada has ever had. And they are totally, totally vested in the, the whole climate focused socialist future. Basically, socialism justified by the need to, to manage the climate, and that's they're, they're totally focused on that, as is the Europe, the whole Davos, G8, all the internationalists, 
for a while there, I think they decided, they thought, well, we can jump off of climate change and go with COVID. We need, right, where, where the, the, the central operating principle of our socialist regime will be COVID instead of climate. But they, bang, they bungled COVID so badly, and now they're back to climate as the central operating, their central operating principle around which their socialist government will, will unfold. And they're totally wedded to that at this point. And, and unless there's major political change in Canada, they're, that's, they're, that's not going to happen. They're, they're net zero. They have, there's net zero 2050 with, net zero, with 2030 interim guidelines for pretty much every sector of the Canadian economy that have been put in place now, oil and gas, plastics, agriculture, housing, industrial buildings, transportation, they're basically the entirety of the Canadian economy is being subsumed into net zero 2050, net zero greenhouse gas emissions by 2050. And they're, they're totally locked into that. So do you think if there was a fairly counted election, a referendum on net zero by 2050 in Canada, do you think people would vote for it, that the voters want that? I, I have a hard time believing the voters want that. So I'm a dual citizen, right? I'm, I'm American and also Canadian, but and I've lived, lived in Canada for about 10 years in total over the course of my, my two, two sojourns there. Canadians don't think like Americans. And so that's actually a harder question to, to think about. Canadians like a regulated world. The, the, the regulation is not a bad word. And so, you know, I, I think, and, and they're all, they're, Canada is also a relatively wealthier country than the United States is, believe it or not. And so they, they, there's this attitude of we can afford it. And so why not? And it's also tied up in sort of a virtue signaling. Canadians like to feel that they're that lead the world in, in these advanced think advanced thinking about protecting the environment and has always been a leader in environmental protection. And Canada does have a gigantic environment, right? And a fairly sensitive one in some places. So if there was a referendum in, I, I don't know. Well, there is a referendum. It's called elections and they keep voting for the liberals and the liberals keep saying, we want to do this. So <laughs> I, I, and they do have, I think they have free and fair elections as free and fair as any governments do. In Canada, they can, yeah. they play different games with their elections. They don't, they don't, they don't play counting games, but they, they, their, their system, because it's parliamentary, right? It's European. They can, they can do other things like move the election dates back and forth for when it's convenient. So they play other games, but anyway, there you go. All right. This has been very good. Do you have any other points you'd like to make before we wrap up? Yeah. If you have a real interest in plastic straws, you should start stocking up. As part of your, you know, your prepping thing, plastic straws are going to be maybe a thing of the past. If you're heavily invested in electric vehicles, I wouldn't be because I think that's one of the things that's going to, to crater soon. I think they're going to hit the wall on the, the battery components and the battery materials. They're already starting to, even all of the major car companies, including the ones making electric cars, are saying, we're not going to commit to net zero, you know, and no, no internal combustion engines by 2030, because we just, we're not seeing it. We don't believe that the technology is going to be there. So that whole electric vehicle transition, I wouldn't, I wouldn't be rewiring my house for that yet. Interesting. On Twitter, I saw somebody had a bill for a replacement EV battery for $16,000 and somebody else said they can cost $40,000. Is that true? The 16 seems high. And I, I think I remember seeing that one too. I think, but I think they were in, it might've been in Europe. Okay. 40,000, I, I don't know, maybe in Australia, but they're, they're close enough to China. I would think it would be cheaper there. It probably depends on the car, but the, if you have the super high density ones, if you like, if you bought the top end, highest performance Tesla with the high end batteries, I, I don't know what they're going for on the open market, but they're not, I can tell you one thing, they're not going to happen. They're not going to get cheaper. So the big reason uh, EVs are not going to take off, you think, is the batteries themselves are too expensive or the trying to get the lithium, et cetera, too expensive? It's about, yeah, it's, it's, yeah. it's about the batteries. You know, Mark Mills, who's a great guy, if you don't follow Mark Mills, I do. you got to get him on one of these. Yes. He's like my guru on energy things. He has pointed out the, the hard physics of what's going on with batteries. And I've known this for a while as well, which is we're up against, they're up against the point where they rammed so much energy into such a dense space Batteries work because you separate a positive charge and a negative charge. And in nature, those things want to come together. And you separate them with a material that's called a dielectric, right? And so, and then the way you make power is you allow them to flow through the dielectric and the charge cancels out and current flows. And we've got so much density of energy in these things that the dielectrics can't keep the charge separated. 
and it's leaking through. It, it actually tunnels through the quantum tunneling the charges getting through. And so they're hitting the they're hitting the hard wall of physics about packing more and more power into small spaces conventionally using using battery technology. And there's there's no evidence that that's going to yield anytime anytime soon. They've been after it now for twenty or, or twenty or thirty years trying to, to to since since nickel cadmium batteries basically were invented. They've been chasing this. And lithium ion took it a little further. But if you look at the if you look at the progress from lead acid to nickel cadmium to lithium ion, it's like this. It's not right. But now they're they're hitting the wall, and it's just like not going anywhere. So, and lithium ion is just not going to do that. It's it's not going to get what you what you want. Not to mention, it's a very dangerous. It's a dangerous technology. As, as I used to joke, it's like, do you really think that the government's going to let you pull two hundred lithium ion battery powered SUVs into the underground parking lots around the Capitol building or anywhere else in the world? You, you want them under your building? Yeah, I, I've seen that. That's in some places they're not letting them park under apartment buildings. I, I well, yeah, you'd be insane. So, yeah. yeah, and uh, also well, I, in in Florida with all the flooding, I think there's been big problems now with those batteries getting wet. And, oh yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, I used, to, I, I used to tell people it's like remember back if, if you're like me, you were a Star Trek fan. Back in the old days, James Kirk would take his phaser, and when they were outnumbered by by the the enemy, he would basically turn it to over set it to overload. And it would turn it into a grenade and he would throw it. It had a five second delay and he'd throw the phaser and it would blow up with a tremendous, like, you know, a gigantic super grenade kind of a thing. And I used to tell students when I'd go to class, I'd say, you know, well, this doesn't have quite that much power, but it's got enough that when you, under norm, other circumstances with a small change in the wiring, this would be called a grenade. Because if you simply can short circuit and immediately just quickly release the power that's in the battery pack of your normal phone, it's going to go off with the power of a, of a, of a hand grenade and an incendiary grenade. That's why they, they used to warn you not to carry them in your shirt pockets and gas stations and stuff. And that's when they, before they were this strong. So imagine having, having and, and you can't put that out when they catch on fire, the Tesla. So yeah, imagine having, having 20 or 30 of those vehicles in a contained structure that burns hot enough to melt steel. Yeah, it'd be, it'd be, no, gasoline is not, you know, as people say, well, oh, cars blow up too, but they only blow up in the movies because they actually attach plastic explosives to them. In real life, they catch fire and, but the fire is contained and it's a liquid fire and it can be put out, but it's not a metal, not a metal fire that, you know, you can't put out, so. All right. Anything else you'd like to cover? It's been very good. I've really enjoyed this. I think that's it. That's good enough for now. Okay. All right. And it's Friday, after, it's Friday afternoon, and it's a beautiful day in the desert here out in Pahrump. Fantastic. All right. Thank you very much. We'll wrap it up here, and I hope to talk to you again. Kenneth yep, P. Green. Talk to you again. Anytime. Thank you very much. Bye. Take care. Bye.